Before I start this review, I feel it's important to have a moment of full disclosure. My relation to Sonic Mania is kind of unique. While I was still in high school, I originally cut my teeth in game development at a website called Sonic Fan Games HQ, or SFGHQ for short. It might seem weird now, but there was actually a period of about five years where no real Sonic games were being released. I mean, yeah, I guess we kind of had games like Sonic 3D Blast and Sonic R, but those were spin-offs, nothing more than distractions between real games. And from 1994 to 1999, none materialized. SFGHQ became a place for Sonic fans to make their own games during this five-year lull. I watched some of my friends grow up to become real game developers at that website, because I was there growing right up along with them. Because of this, I have formed certain opinions on the games made by these people, and of that community as a whole. A handful of SFGHQ community members went on to work on Sonic Mania. This makes Mania a very personal game for me. This isn't just an indie pixel art Sonic game, this is a reflection and a judgement of my entire adolescence. It is a product of our community. And to be honest with you, there's some bittersweet jealousy mixed in with that, because these guys got to live the dream. They graduated from making fan games to real, official Sonic games. And if I'm being honest, I kind of expected them to mess it up. I'd played the fan games these guys had made before, and while stuff like Retro Sonic, Project Metrics, and Sonic Nexus were a decade old or more, I felt like it gave me a pretty good idea where some of the development team's heads were at the last time they tried to make their own game. Good as they were for fan games, could they pull off the real thing? I was skeptical because I didn't think any of us could, myself included. SFGHQ had some extremely talented people in it, but most simply weren't on the same level as making something like Sonic 2. And why would we? Most fan game projects were solo affairs, whereas Sonic 2 was developed by a team of a dozen or more professional Sega employees. I expected Sonic Mania to be a glorified fan game. Passionate to be sure, but ultimately clumsy. Sega claimed they were helping guide Sonic Mania's development, but that wasn't exactly comforting either. Just look at Sonic 4. Even at its best, it never held a candle to the original Genesis games. Though I knew the people working on Sonic Mania were at least smarter than that, it was still hard to shake my worries. At least some of the worries I felt were also from the general fatigue of Sega constantly banking on classic Sonic nostalgia. Sonic Mania represents at least the eighth time Green Hill Zone in some form has made a return appearance. While it could be argued that Mario has always had the Mushroom Kingdom and Zelda's always had Hyrule, Green Hill Zone and its associated reference material weren't really crutches to be leaned on until the release of Sonic 4 Episode 1 in 2010. After that point, nostalgia seemed to become Sonic's primary focus. It's like, hey, do you remember Checkerboard Hills? Do you remember Buzz Bombers or Moto Bugs? What about Metal Sonic? Do you like Metal Sonic? Here's all the Metal Sonic. We'll put him in every game if that'll make you buy it. At this point, it can seem like there are more Sonic games banking on nostalgia than there are games to be nostalgic for. Sonic, once a character embodied with so much forward momentum that they put it in his theme song, has spent nearly a decade being haunted by his past. Instead of focusing on making games with new, good ideas, they were mainly being sold on their nostalgic value to remind us of other, better games. That's largely because the developers at Sonic Team never really seemed to get things right. Despite chasing nostalgia, Sonic Team couldn't help but put their own bizarre spin on things, often to embarrassing results. Between poor controls, incorrect sound effects, and uninspired level designs, all these constant throwbacks did was reinforce the idea that neither Sega or Sonic Team seemed to get what made Sonic special to begin with. This nostalgia was just a hollow gesture to boost sales, as none of the developers apparently had any real affection or understanding of the old games. But that's the first way in which Sonic Mania differs. Sonic Team's logo is nowhere to be found in this game. 
Previously on games like Sonic Advance or Sonic Rush, Sonic Team would take the bulk of the credit, even if some of the developmental legwork was done by another company, like DIMS. Sonic Mania is different, putting Christian Whitehead, Pagoda West, and Head Cannon's names front and center. This is more than a cheap bid at nostalgia. Sonic Mania reads like a true love letter by fans to fans. Or, I guess to use the game's own nomenclature, by the mania for the mania. This is a game stuffed to overflowing with references to Sonic's legacy. Like, yeah, you go back to Chemical Plant from Sonic 2 again, but in the end, it turns into Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. And yeah, it's flying battery from Sonic and Knuckles, but it's also got parts of Sonic CD's wacky workbench, Sonic 2's Wing Fortress Zone, and even parts of Skybase from Sonic 1 on the Master System, all mixed together with its own new, original, unique ideas. I assume there are novel-length wiki articles dissecting all of the most intimate references Sonic Media makes to Sonic's history, and that's fantastic. The love, care, and attention this game received is obvious, and far exceeds Sonic Team's own efforts in every aspect. When talking about Sonic, most tend to focus on his speed. Going fast is a defining aspect of playing a Sonic game, but there's a core essence that the classic Sonic games were built on to help facilitate that. Number one being that Sonic the Hedgehog is meant to be a very simple game. Whereas most classic platformers of the era took notes from Mario's playbook and required two separate buttons for running and jumping, Sonic the Hedgehog used only one button, which allowed him to jump. Without a dedicated run button, Sonic is basically always running, which is why the character focuses on going fast. This influences all of Sonic's control. Unlike when Mario runs, Sonic has a much longer acceleration curve. Given a flat surface, it takes longer for Sonic to reach top speed, lending an element of tension when enemies or other obstacles threaten to break the momentum you've been building up. But what really makes classic Sonic special is how he interacts with the environment. Hills and slopes will change Sonic's physics realistically, where walking uphill is a greater struggle than running downhill. This forms the basis of Sonic's roller coaster gameplay, as you go barreling down hills, around loop de loops, and through other amusement park spectacles. Momentum isn't just earned, it's fought for, cultivated, and meant to be protected. And a well timed spin only enhances your ability to build up speed, even letting Sonic go so fast the game itself has trouble keeping up. Sonic 3's manual infamously even has a line warning you about secret traps, where Sonic can get stuck inside of walls, a result of characters moving so fast the game itself starts to break. Momentum can also be a useful tool. Jumping off of a ramp can provide extra vertical height, allowing for impressive shortcuts. This is the core of what makes classic Sonic special. The best 2D Sonic levels are built with these things in mind, and Sonic Mania might be the first 2D Sonic game in almost 20 years to show an understanding of how any of this works. Christian Whitehead and Headcanon Simon Tomley obviously know their way around classic Sonic, thanks to their work on remastering Sonic CD, Sonic 1, and Sonic 2. This means everything in Sonic Mania works exactly the way it should. Most importantly, Sonic Mania actually introduces a brand new ability, the Drop Dash, that only further emphasizes the importance of rolling into Sonic's ball form. Unfortunately, I feel like something is a little lost. To me, figuring out where and when to roll into a ball is pretty integral to the Sonic experience, because it adds just a little bit of extra strategy to keep track of. That being said, nothing in any of the classic Sonic games ever teach you why rolling is important. It's likely most people finish those games without really understanding why or even how to roll into a ball, and similar complaints could even be leveled against Sonic 3's InstaShield. The Insta Shield extends Sonic's attack radius ever so slightly, making it easier to deal with spiked enemies, but the game never makes that obvious. The Drop Dash theoretically provides more opportunities for a player to experiment with the benefits of rolling, but it's just not intuitive. To execute a Drop Dash, you must first jump into the air, release the jump button, and then, without touching the ground, press the button again and hold it for almost a full second. That probably isn't going to be something you're going to stumble upon by accident. And Sonic Mania itself never teaches you how to use it. The only way you'd know the Drop Dash was even in the game is if you watched interview coverage of the game before it released, heard about the ability from a friend, or tried digging through the game's instruction manual, assuming you could even find it. 
The Drop Dash is an incredibly smart addition to Classic Sonic's moveset, but the game does a poor job of communicating what it is or how to use it. Classic Sonic level design is an interesting beast. A lot of Classic Sonic levels have, at their most basic, two paths. A faster upper path, which is full of more risks but also more rewards, and a slower, more casual lower path that most people usually fall down to after being knocked off the upper path. Some levels in Sonic 2 may even have as many as three or even four overlapping pathways, and Sonic 3 expands things even further with character-specific paths that can only be reached if you're playing as Tails or Knuckles. Sonic Mania picks up the torch from here with what are some of the biggest, most intricately detailed 2D levels ever created for a Sonic game. Though it cuts back on some of the character-specific routes, there are zones in Sonic Mania that are larger than most Sonic 3 levels. But that's also the game's biggest problem, because it ends up being too much of a good thing. One of Sonic 3's biggest levels is Carnival Night Zone, Act 2. It's so big that if you weren't paying attention, it's possible you reach Sonic's time limit. What this means is that if you exceed 10 minutes in any given level, you'll fail that level with a time over, and have to restart from your last checkpoint. In that context, now consider what I just said about the size of Sonic Mania's levels. It's not uncommon to find yourself pushing 6, 7, even 8 minutes or more on every single level past Chemical Plant Zone. And that's not even factoring in extra time spent inside of Special Stages or Blue Spheres minigames. You see, something else Sonic Mania brings over from Sonic 3 is the emphasis on exploration. The only way to get the true ending in one of these Sonic games is to collect all of the Chaos Emeralds. To do that, you have to slow down and look for hidden rooms containing warp rings that send you to one of the game's special stages. From there, you must catch a UFO that's stolen one of the seven emeralds. On one hand, if you pump the brakes and hunt for these secrets, you're almost guaranteed to break that 10 minute limit. But on the other, if you hurry through levels, you'll never get that true ending. You have to pick one or the other, and the game does a poor job balancing this. Speedruns may finish these stages in significantly less time, but that's a dedicated play focusing on practiced routes, which is far removed from how the average person will experience the game, especially on their first time through. Now, the upcoming Sonic Mania Plus will contain an option to turn the time limit off, but it's worth mentioning it's on a menu normally containing secret options that must be unlocked before you can select them. It's possible you'll have to finish the game once or meet some other sort of secret requirement before you can turn the time limit off, but I'll cover that in a separate follow-up video after Sonic Mania Plus launches. Right now, in the game's original state, it's a huge problem, and it makes it feel like the game is fighting against its own design. Even if you are afforded the option to disable the time limit in Sonic Mania, the sheer size and complexity of these levels ripples through the rest of the game. If you look at other 2D games from the early to mid-90s, most have levels that take around three minutes or less to clear. Mario, Mega Man, Donkey Kong Country, Kirby, Castlevania, even third stringers like Bubsy or Cool Spot rarely ask the player to remain focused for more than three consecutive minutes, maybe four tops. And this is even kind of baked into a lot of modern games. Think of a game like Uncharted. Over the course of 10 or 15 minutes, you might spend some time climbing, which leads into a stealth section that goes wrong and turns into combat. Even if the overall scene is long, the way it engages the player is constantly changing every few minutes. That's because after a while, doing the same things in the same level for so long gets to be kind of exhausting. That's not to say Sonic Mania is short on ideas or can't support its seven and a half minute levels. Like I said earlier, any given zone is like three or four different stages mashed together. It's a lot of very compacted things with nary a pixel to be wasted, but that starts to wear on you. Maybe this will only play to my North American viewers, but by the time I finished Sonic Mania, I had a feeling that can only be described as the third night of Thanksgiving leftovers. 
Okay, so you have Thanksgiving, right? Which is a holiday with origins in the harvest celebration, where farmers would have all this food from crops they planted earlier in the year, and everybody eats until they feel sick. Usually, you have so much food for Thanksgiving that you have enough for leftovers on the second night, where you also usually eat way too much. And by the third night, you've eaten so much food that the mere thought of another dinner roll or sweet potato makes you feel a wary, deathly ache deep within your bones. That's kind of what it was like when the credits began to roll after almost six hours with Sonic Mania. Enjoyable as it was, my body just couldn't take anymore, whether I wanted it or not. Unfortunately, Sonic Mania's length problems don't just end with the levels themselves. One of my big fears going into Mania was how the game would handle boss encounters. Boss fights are something even seasoned developers working on big-budget AAA games can and do get wrong. And for indie games, especially fan games, boss fights miss more often than they hit. Too many modern boss battles focus more on making the boss you're fighting into a character. Usually what this boils down to is fighting a boss that's invulnerable for long stretches of time in order to give them moments that show off their personality, either through big flashy animations or long attack patterns that must be avoided. That looks cool, but in terms of gameplay it means you're waiting for the boss to repeat a stupid mistake over and over and over so that they can expose their weak point and give you an opportunity to hit back. That's less a fight and more like standing at the bottom of a flight of stairs hoping your rival will fall down them. And hoping they'll do it more than once. It not only insults the player's intelligence, but it makes the enemy they're fighting look like an idiot for letting it happen so many times. And above all else, it's just boring. This was definitely true of the new Hidden Palace Zone boss, added to Christian Whitehead and Simon Tomley's remastered mobile version of Sonic 2. While it was cool looking, deciphering the tedious steps required to actually damage the boss just wasn't fun, and I was worried this kind of logic would carry forward to Sonic Mania. Thankfully, most of them aren't quite that bad, but the main problem is that the boss fights just never end. When you reach the end of Hydro City Act 2, for example, you face two full-length bosses back to back. Phase 1 has you guiding bombs into propeller blades, and Phase 2 is just a carbon copy of a boss from Sonic 3. No changes, no twists, just the exact same boss from Sonic 3. If two bosses back to back sounds weird, then consider the fight with Metal Sonic at the end of Stardust Speedway. It's four entirely separate phases as you scramble your way up to the top of a tower for a final showdown. Depending on how quickly you can get through everything, this one boss fight by itself can take anywhere from three to over seven minutes to finish. To put things in perspective, if you collected all of the Chaos Emeralds and came into this boss fight as Sonic's ring-draining supersonic form, you would need between 200 and 500 rings in order to make it through the entire boss fight without losing your powers. I don't even know if there are that many rings in Stardust Speedway Act 2 total, because it's one of the shortest levels in the game. It has to be for how long it takes you to fight Metal Sonic. Those are the two worst examples, but too many of these boss fights don't respect your time and don't do a good job rewarding skilled play. Take the boss at the end of Studiopolis Act 2, which is basically just a random number generator that tells you whether or not you get to damage the boss. A textbook Sonic the Hedgehog boss has simple mechanics, is easy to hit, and goes down quickly once you know the trick. Eggman is more often than not a damage sponge, whereas a boss fight in something like Mario adheres to Miyamoto's so-called rule of threes because it usually only takes three hits to defeat, Eggman usually takes eight hits or more. It's imperative that players can freely wail on Eggman because of this, and most fights in the Genesis games are more about managing a quick, aggressive assault instead of standing around waiting for your turn. Too many of Sonic Mania's boss fights lean on a crazy reference or a cool visual concept when that's only half the battle and the amount of time you spend fighting this stuff just makes the exhaustion issues I mentioned earlier even worse. Because let's be honest, one of the last things you feel like doing after playing through a super long level is fighting an equally long boss fight. The argument could be made that the bosses and the levels are just fine the way they are, 
that I'm the one overdoing it, that I should pace myself and exercise better self-control to avoid burning out. Such an argument completely misunderstands the concept of pacing itself. People who play video games inherently fall into bad habits because of the nature of play. Gaming and addictive behavior can be very closely related, because fun games are the ones that you don't want to turn off. It's the best kind of problem to have as a developer, but it's still a problem nonetheless. It's the job of the game designer to find ways to snap players out of those bad habits, because the players themselves will rarely do it on their own. If Sonic Mania has problems with pacing, it shouldn't be up to me to pace myself, because the game should be giving me more places to stop and recharge. This is the actual reason levels in all of those other games tend to be so short. Completing an objective is a lot like a punctuation mark at the end of a sentence, insofar as it lets you stop and take a breath. <sighs> I get that Sonic Mania is supposed to be a maniac's tribute to Sonic the Hedgehog, but it also asks you to hold your breath for a really, really long time. To engage in a little bit of backseat game design, there are ways Sonic Mania could have handled its length problem and still remained enjoyable. For example, instead of two acts per zone, Sonic Mania could have implemented the original Sonic's three-act structure. This would allow them to keep roughly the same amount of content they already have, but spread it out with more opportunities to stop and recharge. Actually, as long as we're mentioning recharging, Sonic Mania could also do a better job saving your progress, too. For example, let's say you're at Flying Battery Zone, it's Act 2, you've gone through the entire 6 minute level and you rage quit at the frustrating spider boss at the end of the level. You just shut the game off, that's it. But 30 minutes later you cool off and decide to try again. In the current version of Sonic Mania, reloading your save file from Flying Battery will start you all the way back at the beginning of Act 1, erasing up to 15 minutes of work. That's unacceptable. It needs to be better at letting you resume your progress from wherever you left off. Ideally, it should be resuming from the last checkpoint you touched. Because let's be honest, it's not 1994 anymore. People are playing Sonic Mania on the bus or during their lunch break at work. What if the batteries on their Nintendo Switch are dying and they don't have time to finish the level or get to a charger? Sonic Mania isn't built to consider these kinds of scenarios, and it probably should. Heck, being able to resume from the middle of a stage may even help with levels feeling too long, because it would free you to stop playing whenever you felt like it. As an extreme example of dealing with this game's length, Sonic Mania could even implement Sonic Jam's Easy Mode. For those of you who don't know what this is, I'll explain. So Sonic Jam was a Sega Saturn collection of the four main Sega Genesis Sonic games. It came with all kinds of extras and even a few bonus modes, including a brand new Easy Mode. When easy mode was enabled, you'd face fewer enemies, have more power-ups, and, and even skip entire levels. That might sound kind of lame, but hear me out. There was nothing better than to kick back on a chill Sunday afternoon and play through a highlight reel of Sonic's best moments. You could start the original Sonic the Hedgehog at 4pm and be done with Sonic 3 and Knuckles before dinner. The real, full, original versions of those games were still there when you wanted to take things seriously, but having a more casual mode available made for a nice, breezy, relaxing experience. For a game that can sometimes feel like a grind, that's definitely something Sonic Mania could benefit from. Sonic Mania's breathless enthusiasm for the Hedgehog's 16-bit history is both its most powerful strength and greatest weakness. This is a game so bursting with passion that it is near its breaking point. The multitude of cheap cash-ins during the Mascots with Attitude fad in the early 90s serves as a reminder that classic Sonic's gameplay is a tricky recipe to get right. 
the Sonic Mania team has done a better job than anyone else has, including Sega and Sonic Team themselves. After a certain point, it becomes pretty clear that Sega either isn't interested in what people originally liked about Sonic the Hedgehog, or they genuinely have no idea how to replicate it. Sega should be the masters of this sort of game already, teaching the newbies how these games worked, not the other way around. It's like this freaky Ouroboros, where it looks like Sega is being shown how to make a classic Sonic game by the people who learned all this stuff from Sega 25 years ago. Imagine graduating from school and having to reteach all of your algebra lessons back to your math teachers because they're the ones that don't know the answers. Sonic Mania somehow manages to pull success out of that impossible paradox. This is the game that Sonic 4 should have been. Heck, this is the game Sonic Generations should have been. Its biggest flaw is that, like I said earlier, it's just too much of a good thing. Which is a pretty significant flaw. Maybe if it was still 1994, I was still 11 years old, and I had an entire summer vacation ahead of me, things would be different. Maybe then Sonic Mania would become my new favorite Sonic game, surpassing even Sonic 3 & Knuckles. But it's 2018, I'm about to be 35, and my plate is overflowing with other things to do. I've changed, the world has changed, and Sonic Mania hasn't. Undoubtedly, that's mission accomplished for a development team so focused on retro gameplay, but it makes it difficult for me to play it in the same context I do with the other 16-bit Sonic games. I like those old games enough that they are almost constantly in my rotation. It's rare for me to go more than a few months without messing around in one of them, but with Sonic Mania, once I've properly finished the game as all of its characters, I just haven't really had the urge to go back to it. Its levels are just too long and too complex for a quick pick-up-and-play session, especially when you start thinking about its tedious boss fights. Sonic Mania is not unlike asking a super fan to describe their favorite thing in the world. It's a rambling, way-too-deep conversation that keeps going even long after you might have lost interest. It's got a lot of ideas and it expresses a lot of love, it's just it needed a little more tempering. I wouldn't call it the best Sonic game ever made, but I might be willing to call it the ultimate Sonic game, if that makes sense. I still really like it, I think it's an impressive accomplishment, I just don't know when I'll ever get the urge to play it again. Sonic Mania contains everything that made Sonic great, compressed into one of the most densely packed games in this series, for better or worse. If you're the type where finishing a game just once is never enough, Sonic Mania will keep you coming back. Just make sure to pace yourself. Thank you all for your patience while I put this video together. I actually wrote most of it last September, but then my life was turned upside down. Between moving to a new state, the PC version delay, being in the hospital, my desktop breaking down, and more, it has been a long, difficult road in getting this review done. I thought about just waiting until the release of Sonic Mania Plus, but y'all have waited long enough, so stay tuned for a follow-up video when the update releases. Thank you goes out to Claris Robin for usage of her Sonic Mania speedrun footage. There's a link to her channel down in the video description. I definitely recommend giving it a look if you want to see what real high-speed Sonic Mania gameplay is like. Special thanks go out to all my Patreon supporters. Logan, Brando, Juan Pablo, Dave M, Setsune Weifel, Connor F, Thomas G, Tom B, Manuma, Nolan, Fiesta, Matt, Ryan M, Keith, Connor S, Sam, Tim, Anders, Ryan L, Christopher, Rose, Lucas, and Steven. <laughs> you guys have all been saints. Actually, speaking of Ryan L, for those of you who don't know, that's Arlan2, the founder of Sonic Fan Games HQ, the website I mentioned way back at the start of this review. Given how many people working on Sonic Mania were members of that community, I was surprised Ryan wasn't given a special thanks in Sonic Mania's credits. If it wasn't for Ryan and his Sonic Fan Games HQ website, there probably wouldn't be a Sonic Mania. Be sure to thank him by reading his blogs and playing the games he worked on over at Halfbrick and now Pickpock. He really deserves the recognition. And if you want to follow me, I have blogs and social media and all that fun stuff too. You can also support me financially through Patreon so that I can keep doing this kind of stuff in the future. I also release exclusive music, video, games, and Patreon donors can even hear the original, very different version of this review that I recorded back in September of last year. So there's tons of reasons to pledge your support. 
I even have links to Ko-fi and PayPal.me for those of you who don't like rolling monthly donations and only feel like donating once. Just visit Patreon.com slash BlazeHedgehog to learn more. And finally, as cliche as it might be, liking this video and subscribing to my channel does help me out more than you realize, but I won't twist your arm about it if you don't want to. See you in the next video.